My name is Nick Linthorn and I'm going to be talking to you about how to get students to understand statistical concepts more quickly. So in most sports sciences courses, we try and get the students to develop intuitive feel for experimental data. What we want is the student to understand descriptive statistics. So that means things like the mean and the standard deviation. We also want the student to understand that all measurements have uncertainties associated with them. So we need to get them to appreciate that and how to calculate confidence intervals, how to report data with an appropriate number of significant figures, and to include error bars on plots. However, this is often a slow process. The student develops this intuitive, intuitive feel relatively slowly by analysing different data sets using software such as SPSS and Excel. And also, we often have a problem with sample size. So in sports biomechanics studies, we have sample sizes of less than 50, and this means that the uncertainties in statistical parameters are large. And also we can have random variations of data and this can be sometimes be misinterpreted by the student. So I have two ways of getting the student to develop a statistical in intuition more quickly. The first one is to get them to look at visual representations of the statistical parameter. And the second one is to get the students to simulate data sets and then to visually examine a large number of these simulated data sets. So I'm going to show you some examples and the data that I've used is the jump I achieved in a counter movement jump. So here's an example of how the mean depends on sample size. So in this diagram, we've got a jump height with a mean value of about of 40 centimetres. And these are the confidence limits and it does what we expect as you increase the sample size the confidence limits become smaller and we also notice when there's really small sample sizes these confidence limits or this confidence interval can be quite large so having a diagram like this is a good way of getting the student to have an intuitive feel for the mean value and there is a good practical application of this. So in a counter movement jump test, we want to know, well, how many jump trials should the participant do? And the way we decide that is by looking at this plot that we've looked at before. So this is the jump height. And the thing is, we don't, can't take too many trials because that will make the test last a long time. So we don't want to be down in this region. And likewise, we don't want to be in this region here where we have too few trials because that means that the uncertainty in the mean value is quite large. So there's a good compromise region, which is somewhere between about five and eight trials. There's a good compromise between reducing the uncertainty in the mean and the time spent testing. So here's a visual representation of how the standard deviation depends on sample size. So in this particular example, we had a jump height of 40 centimetres, but here we've got a standard deviation in the jump height of two centimetres. And again, we have curves of how the confidence limits depend on sample size. And this does what we expect is that the more samples you take, the better you know the standard, standard deviation. But also notice that even with a fairly large sample size, we don't know the st standard deviation very well. So even at a fairly large sample size here, although this standard deviation should be two, when we go and do some measurements, we could get values of anywhere between three and one. We haven't pinned it down very well. So that's a general feature about a standard deviation is you don't know it very well, even if you have a lot of samples, a lot of measurements. So there's a good practical application for this and that is when you're trying to decide how to report a mean and a standard deviation and the previous diagram illustrated that you don't know the standard deviation very well and really you're only justified in reporting it to one significant figure in most sports sciences studies. So this is how you should report it, your mean and standard deviation, you should round the standard deviation to one significant figure and so a the appropriate way of reporting your mean standard deviation is 46 plus or minus three centimetres. Here's a more complex example. This is the correlation coefficient. Again, it's the same sort of thing. We want to know what the confidence interval is, is for the correlation coefficient. 
Unfortunately, software like SPSS doesn't do this for you, but you can go online and find a calculator or even find an Excel spreadsheet and you can put in the, your values of the correlation coefficient and sample size and it will give you a value for the confidence interval. But again, this is not very useful. It's hard to develop an intuitive feel for how it behaves, how the confidence correlation coefficient behaves. So a way around it is to produce a visual representation. So this is a visual representation of how the correlation coefficient, how the confidence intervals and correlation coefficient depend on the value of the correlation coefficient and also on the number of samples. So the way you interpret this graph is, well, here's an example. You've gone and measured some data and you've obtained a value for a correlation coefficient of 0.6 but these curves show the confidence limits. And so this confidence limits for this correlation coefficient of 0.6 uh, actually could be somewhere between 0.7 and 0.5. So but in most sports biomechanics studies, we don't have many samples. So therefore the correlation coefficient is actually can be quite large. So here, it varies somewhere between 0.8 and 0.3. Another interesting thing about this visual representation is that it shows that as you have lower correlation coefficients, the confidence interval becomes larger. So now we've only got 20, uh, so sorry, now we've got a correlation coefficient of 0.2, and we've got a very large uh, confidence interval. So these are features that you wouldn't understand by just putting numbers into a, into a, a spreadsheet and the visual representation shows how it behaves. Another thing I get my students to do is to simulate some data sets. So here is some simulated data for a jump height of 40 centimetres. And if you go and generate, have 20, uh, 200 samples, you can see that this show, uh, as a roughly normal distribution. So this data was generated using Excel, using the random number generator, and also the uh, normal distribution function. So, here it is in an Excel spreadsheet. And the good thing about this Excel spreadsheet is that you can, each time you save the file, you can generate a new set of data. So that's what I'm doing now generating new data sets and occasionally something interesting will show up. So you see in this example here that here it looks like, oh yes, this is an outlier in, in, this, uh, in this data set, but actually what um, all these uh, generating all these different samples has shown is that this is this actually isn't a, an outlier. It's just we've just been unlucky. We've just uh, produced a data point at one of the extremes of the distribution. So there are two key take home messages from all of this work. And the first one is examining visual representations can help the student develop a, a deeper understanding of statistical concepts. So things that you can't necessarily uh, appreciate just by putting numbers into uh, some software. And another useful thing is to generate simulated data sets because this can help the student appreciate the effects of random fluctuations in data. So thank you for watching this presentation and I hope you found it useful.